between the time when the oceans drank Atlantis and the rise of the sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of. And on to this, Conan, destined to bear the jeweled crown of Aquilonia upon a troubled brow. It is I, his chronicler, who alone can tell thee of his saga. Let me tell you of the days of high adventure. Hello everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of Conan Chronicles. This is the podcast series where I, your host, Dan, will be doing a review and retrospective on all things Conan the Barbarian. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the third Conan story in publication order, The Tower of the Elephant. This one was, of course, penned by Mr. Robert E. Howard, and was originally published all the way back in the March 1933 issue of Weird Tales magazine. According to Finn J.D. John's Robert E. Howard Conan, The Complete Weird Tales Omnibus, which is where I'm reading these stories, The Tower of the Elephant is considered by Robert E. Howard and Conan fans to be the first quote-unquote real Conan story. That's because this is the first one where we get to see Conan not as an aged king fighting to preserve his tenuous grip on the throne of Aquilonia, but instead here as a thieving adventurer. While I don't think that this statement is an indictment, necessarily, of the prior stories in publication order, I would say that I agree with the general consensus here that The Tower of the Elephant is indeed what I thought I was getting myself into when seeking out stories about Conan. My first exposure to the character was, like I expect is for many people, the 1982 Conan the Barbarian film starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. While both of Arnold's outings as Conan end with a striking image of the Barbarian sitting on the throne of Aquilonia, I sort of assumed that the typical Conan story was something more akin to that film's plot. It was strange to me when reading the Robert E. Howard stories for the first time in their originally published order that these stories featuring the teased but never delivered upon ending from the Schwarzenegger films were the basis for the first two Conan stories ever published. In this story, however, our story opens on a decidedly less regal note. Torches flared murkily on the revels in the mall, where the thieves of the east held carnival by night. In the mall they could carouse and roar as they liked, for honest people shunned the quarters, and watchmen, well paid with stained coins, did not interfere with their sport. Along the crooked, unpaved streets, with their heaps of refuse and sloppy puddles, drunken roisterers staggered, roaring. Steel glinted in the shadows where wolf preyed on wolf, and from the darkness rose the shrill laughter of women and the sounds of scufflings and strugglings. Torchlight licked luridly from broken windows and wide-thrown doors, and out of those doors, stale smells of wine and rank sweaty bodies, clamor of drinking jacks and fists hammered on rough tables, snatches of obscene songs rushed like a blow in the face. In one of these dens, merriment thundered to the low smoke-stained roof, where rascals gathered in every stage of rags and tatters, furtive cut purses, leering kidnappers, quick-fingered thieves, swaggering bravos with their winches, strident-voiced women clad in tawdry finery. Native rogues were the dominant element, dark-skinned, dark-eyed Zamorians, with daggers at their girdles and guile in their hearts. But there were wolves of half a dozen outland nations there as well. 
There was a giant Hyperborean renegade, taciturn, dangerous, with a broadsword strapped to his great gaunt frame. For men wore steel openly in the mall. There was a Shemitish counterfeiter, with his hooked nose and curled blue-black beard. There was a bold-eyed Brethunian wench, sitting on the knee of a tawny-haired gunderman, a wandering mercenary soldier, a deserter from some defeated army and the fat, gross rogue whose body jests were causing all the shouts of mirth was a professional kidnapper come up from distant Koth to teach woman-stealing to Zamorians, who were born with more knowledge of the art than he could ever attain. This is the environment in which Conan exists in the pages of the Tower of the Elephant. Here we first meet Conan on the dangerous streets of Aranjun, the capital city of the Zamorian kingdom. Aranjun has a reputation for being the quote-unquote city of thieves, where the wily and cunning from all walks of life come to stash their stolen fortunes and partake in all of the hedonism that the city has to offer. Our favorite warrior of this barbaric age over here is a slaver who specializes in kidnapping women to be sold as sex slaves, speaking of a mysterious secret of the elephant tower in a tavern. Intrigued by the slaver's drunken ramblings, a young Conan inquires about the tower and whether its secret could be stolen. The slaver laughs in the Sumerian's face, amused by his naivety. He tells Conan that a powerful priest of evil gods named Yara lives in the Tower of the Elephant and personally protects the tower's secret, a great jewel called the Heart of the Elephant. The slaver mocks Conan, telling him that it's obvious that such a treasure, stashed in the city of thieves, home to the most skilled bandits of the Hyborian Age, would already have been stolen if such a heist was possible. Conan bristles at the slaver's condescending tone, causing tempers to flare, and a fight eventually breaks out between them. The violent fervor spreads to the other patrons of the tavern, and the place is thrown into a state of drunken chaos. When the dust settles, the only trace of the barbarian left is the corpse of the slaver, slain by a sword of Sumerian steel. In the midst of the commotion, Conan leaves the tavern and makes his way through the city to the nearby Tower of the Elephant. The barbarian stealthily attempts to infiltrate the outer walls surrounding the tower when he meets another thief attempting to pull off the same heist. It turns out that this man, Taurus of Nemedia, is known throughout the kingdoms as the Prince of Thieves due to his legendary and unparalleled thieving skills. After some introductions, Conan agrees to help Taurus infiltrate the tower. The two thieves successfully make it through the treacherous grounds of the tower, protected by armed guards and a pack of lions, before beginning to scale the walls of the tower with a rope. The two make it to the top and enter the tower's highest room. Inside, a terrifying spider monster swiftly kills Taurus, before Conan kills the beast, only narrowly escaping with his life. Left alone in this mysterious tower, Conan begins to descend a set of stairs into its lower levels. In the first room he finds, hidden from the world by gigantic doors made of ivory, Conan encounters a fascinating creature of otherworldly horror. He was looking into a large chamber with a domed golden ceiling. The walls were of green jade, the floor of ivory, partly covered by thick rugs. Smoke and exotic scent of incense floated up from a brazier on a golden tripod, and behind it sat an idol on a sort of marble couch. Conan stared aghast. The image had the body of a man, naked and green in color, but the head was of one of nightmare and madness. Too large for the human body, it had no attributes of humanity. Conan stared at the wide, flaring ears, the curling proboscis, on either side of which stood white tusks tipped with round golden balls. The eyes were closed as if in sleep. This, then, was the reason for the name, the Tower of the Elephant, for the head of the thing was much like that of the beasts described by the Shemitish Wanderer. This was Yara's god. Where, then, should the gem be, but concealed in the idol, since the stone was called the Elephant's Heart? As Conan came forward, his eyes fixed on the motionless idol, the eyes of the thing opened suddenly. The Sumerian froze in his tracks. 
It was no image. It was a living thing, and he was trapped in its chamber. That he did not instantly explode in a burst of murderous frenzy is a fact that measures his horror, which paralyzed him where he stood. A civilized man in his position would have sought doubtful refuge in the conclusion that he was insane. It did not occur to the Sumerian to doubt his senses. He knew he was face to face with a demon of the Elder World, and the realization robbed him of all his faculties except sight. The trunk of the horror was lifted and quested about. The topaz eyes stared unseeingly, and Conan knew the monster was blind. With the thought came a thawing of his frozen nerves, and he began to back silently toward the door. But the creature heard. The sensitive trunk stretched toward him, and Conan's horror froze him again when the being spoke in a strange, stammering voice that never changed its key or timbre. The Sumerian knew that those jaws were never built or intended for human speech. Who is here? Have you come to torture me again, Yara? Will you never be done? Oh, Yagkosha, is there no end to agony? Tears rolled from the sightless eyes, and Conan's gaze strayed to the limbs stretched on the marble couch, and he knew the monster would not rise to attack him. He knew the marks of the rack and the searing brand of the flame, and tough-souled as he was, he stood aghast at the ruined deformities which his reason told him had once been limbs as comely as his own. And suddenly, all fear and repulsion went from him to be replaced by a great pity. What this monster was, Conan could not know, but the evidences of its sufferings were so terrible and pathetic that a strange, aching sadness came over the Sumerian. He knew not why. He only felt that he was looking upon a cosmic tragedy, and he shrank with shame as if the guilt of a whole race were laid upon him. This strange creature, with the body of a man and the head of an elephant, reveals to Conan that it is in fact an extraterrestrial being, exiled from his homeworld after being on the losing side of a great war between his people. Oh man, listen, said the strange being. I am foul and monstrous to you, am I not? Nay, do not answer, I know. But you would seem as strange to me could I see you. There are many worlds besides this earth, and life takes many shapes. I am neither god nor demon, but flesh and blood like yourself, though the substance differ in part, and the form be cast in different mold. I am very old, O man of the waste countries. Long and long ago I came to this planet with others of my world, from the green planet Yag, which circles forever in the outer fringe of this universe. We swept through space on mighty wings that drove us through the cosmos quicker than light, because we had warred with the kings of Yag and were defeated and outcast. But we could never return, for on Earth our wings withered from our shoulders. Here we abode apart from earthly life, we fought the strange and terrible forms of life which then walked the earth, so that we became feared and were not molested in the dim jungles of the east where we had our abode. We saw men grow from the ape and build the shining cities of Volusia, Camellia, Camoria, and their sisters. We saw them reel before the thrusts of the heathen Atlanteans and Picts and Lemurians, we saw the oceans rise and engulf Atlantis and Lemuria, and the isles of the Picts, and the shining cities of civilization. We saw the survivors of Pictum and Atlantis build their Stone Age empires and go down to ruin, locked in bloody wars. We saw the Picts sink into abysmal savagery, the Atlanteans into apedom again. We saw new savages drift southward in conquering waves from the Arctic Circle to build a new civilization with new kingdoms called Nemedia and Koth and Aquilonia and their sisters. We saw your people rise under a new name from the jungles of the apes that had been Atlanteans. We saw the descendants of the Lemurians, who had survived the Cataclysm, rise again through savagery and ride westward as Hyrcanians. 
and we saw this race of devils, survivors of the ancient civilization that was before Atlantis sank, come once more into culture and power, this accursed kingdom of Zamora. All this we saw, neither aiding nor hindering the immutable cosmic law, and one by one we died. For we of Yag are not immortal, though our lives are as the lives of planets and constellations. At last I alone was left, dreaming of old times among the ruined temples of jungle-lost Katai, worshipped as a god by an ancient yellow-skinned race. Then came Yara, versed in dark knowledge handed down through the days of barbarism since before Atlantis sank. The alien tells Conan that Yara, the priest who resides in the tower, had enslaved and tortured him for years. He gestures toward the heart of the elephant, a grand red jewel on display in the chamber, and asks Conan to exact revenge on Yara for him, which he can't do as the end of his life draws near. He instructs Conan to cut his heart out of his chest, squeeze the blood within on the jewel, and find Yara in the lower levels of the tower. He tells Conan to then recite an incantation to invoke the dead alien's wrath. Conan does as the creature told him, and takes the blood-soaked jewel down into the chambers of the evil priest. Conan finds Yara in a meditative state, ripe for the picking, and recites the incantation. Immediately, the heart of the elephant begins to magically shrink the evil priest down to a tiny size and sucks him into its center, seemingly trapping him there for all eternity. After Yara is engulfed by the magic gem, it disappears, and Conan hastily escapes the tower, empty-handed, but left contemplating the alien he had encountered in the tower. Like the Scarlet Citadel, the prior Robert E. Howard story that I reviewed for Conan Chronicles, the Tower of the Elephant sort of builds from the concepts that were established in the prior stories to great effect in my view. Of course, it's always important to keep in mind Howard didn't write these stories in the order that they were eventually published, as Weird Tales often rejected some stories or asked them to be rewritten, while others that the editors liked were published with just a few editorial notes. But the Tower of the Elephant, certainly to me anyway, feels like an expansion of the Hyborian Age setting that Conan and the other characters of Howard's world here inhabit. Both the Phoenix on the Sword and the Scarlet Citadel speak often of, and directly show, the brutality of the Hyborian Age. Conan frequently brutally murders people, assassins and conspirators lurk in every shadow, and evil wizards cast wicked spells under the cover of darkness. However, because Conan is the king of Aquilonia in those two stories, we spend most of them either in his perspective or the perspective of people powerful enough to seek the throne of the kingdom. We don't spend a ton of time amongst the common people of this wild and untamed age. In the opening scene, we meet Conan in a crowded tavern, filled with all manner of vagabonds and ne'er-do-wells. The man he speaks with there is a slaver who kidnaps women and sells them into sex slavery. One of the things that I quite like about Howard's conception of this fantastical chapter in human history is that while there's obviously quite a bit of romanticism present in the trappings of the heroic adventure genre that he's writing within, the setting that he places these adventures in is anything but romanticized. If you go back and watch many of the Hollywood sword and sandal historical epics from the golden age of Hollywood about Greece and Rome, you'll see a sort of idealized depiction of these ancient civilizations. The Romans and Greeks dress in loose-fitting white robes and golden jewelry. The sets look like shining buildings supported by immaculately crafted white pillars. And many of the characters are portrayed as wise statesmen and women, politely sipping wine from decadent goblets and discussing the merits of democracy or something. These ancient civilizations are portrayed as having clean and orderly civil societies. After all, if the Roman Republic, for example, didn't appear like a paradise on Earth, would its fall be as tragic? Would a society filled with many of the same flaws we see in modern civilizations 
appear as worth saving as a shining city on a hill lost to the mists of time? Likely not, but thankfully Howard disposes with all of that romanticism that we see in stuff like that, and instead uses his actual knowledge of human history to define the way people have organized themselves in the civilizations of the Hyborian Age. In Howard's world, there are entire cities that act as havens for vagabonds and thieves. Men kidnap women and sell them as concubines for profit. The heroes of this time get into drunken bar fights and kill men who condescend to them, etc. One of the themes and central conflicts for Conan's character throughout many of the later stories that we see here is the corrupting nature of civilized life. Conan himself has a disdain for the civilized world, their people, their cities, their culture, their customs, etc. Conan is a Sumerian, a man raised in the harsh, cold wilderness of the north. Sumerians live in small, tribal villages and do what they must to survive. Conan's stories often play with the question of what the difference is between quote-unquote civilized life and what Conan believes is the natural state of man, barbarism. In Conan's general view, barbarism is what allowed tribes to evolve into highly organized civilizations in the first place. If people did not take what they needed to thrive from their surroundings, human, animal, or plant, such decadence would be impossible. Conan believes that such decadence isolates people from the harsh realities of the world, the ones that he had to battle every day as a Sumerian to survive. And after all, if being civilized means organizing systems of chattel slavery, war, and cutthroat politics dominated by the greedy and corrupt, is civilization even worth constructing? This theme and conflict for Conan as a character is not quite fully developed here, but you can see the seeds of it with how the criminal underworld of the Hyborian Age operates, even in the most successful of kingdoms. Conan is immediately made to feel like a barbaric misfit by a man whose trade is kidnapping and brutal slavery. Sort of ironic when you think about it. Who's more of a brute? Conan, or a man who sells women as property for a living? I'll leave that up to you to decide, but I think the answer is pretty clear. In any case, I quite enjoyed getting to see the seedy nature of the ancient Hyborian kingdoms on a more grounded level as a young Conan tries to make his way in the world, rather than seeing this age from the height of political power. I also liked that Howard continues with the otherworldly cosmic horror vibe that's present in the Scarlet Citadel when Conan begins encountering the strange monsters in Tsafalanti's dungeon. While the elephant-headed alien man ends up not being a monster looking to harm Conan, Howard's descriptions of the creature were enough to create unease in Conan's mind, and mine. The scene in this story where Conan speaks with the elephant alien is probably my favorite single scene I've read in a Conan story so far. It's such an interesting blend of science fiction and fantasy that I think makes the setting of Conan unique amongst other high fantasy universes, I suppose. When I was reading this, I couldn't help but think of things like the History Channel Ancient Aliens show, uh, the Marvel Comics characters The Eternals, and the 1968 book on ancient alien theory that inspired Jack Kirby to create The Eternals, which was called Chariot of the Gods. The thesis of these three works, fictionalized or not, is that in Earth's ancient past, humans were visited by extraterrestrials, and these aliens in one way or another influenced the course of human civilization's development. Who knew that all the way back in the 1930s, Howard was exploring his own fictionalized version of the ancient aliens theory through Conan? The science fiction elements of Conan's world also reminded me of Jack Kirby and later creators like Walter Simonson's take on the Marvel version of Thor. From the very beginning, the Marvel version of Thor was a blend of high fantasy and the more science fiction-y elements of the Marvel Universe that were already in place at the time of Thor's first appearance. It's easy to see why a character like Conan eventually translated so well into the comic book medium, and specifically, Marvel Comics' catalog of monthly series. 
The Hyborian Age is a concept somewhat similar to the things Marvel had already been publishing for years when they secured the rights to do a Conan comic book and let Roy Thomas and John Buscema do their thing on that book for more than a decade. I also quite liked that this story portrays Conan as most know and love him, not yet an old man, but as a barbaric, thieving adventurer. Conan here isn't a man past his prime, burdened by the responsibilities of the throne he thought he was so unsuited for in the two prior stories. Conan's quest here is very simple and straightforward. He wants to steal a magic jewel from an evil wizard's tower for no other reason than he lives for adventure and wants to get rich. That sort of conceit frees the character up to have a fun, swashbuckling adventure, and I quite enjoyed that. One of this story's main claims to fame in the adventuring department is that it directly inspired one of the sequences from the 1982 Conan the Barbarian film. There's a scene in that movie where Conan and Subutai scale a tower in pursuit of a valuable jewel that they heard lies within. While attempting to infiltrate the tower, they encounter another character attempting to also do the same thing, who is Valeria instead of the Prince of Thieves we meet in the Tower of the Elephant. After some introductions, the trio scales the tower, and Conan has to fight the giant snake from the Scarlet Citadel to get the jewel, and eventually the trio escape with it. It's cool to know that while the first Schwarzenegger Conan film does depart from the source material in some ways, they were at least putting things from the original Howard stories in there to make interesting action-adventure sequences. The only real criticism I have of the Tower of the Elephant is that the main villain of the piece, an evil priest named Yara, is barely a character here. On the one hand, these sort of villainous wizard types are a dime a dozen in Howard's Conan stories, and I was admittedly less interested in Yara than all the other aspects of the story, because he just feels like one of those villains again. However, Yara stands out amongst the villains of the three stories I've reviewed so far as the least developed and therefore, in my view, the least interesting. He barely gets any opportunity to even twirl his mustache and chew scenery. The part of the story where Conan confronts him is extremely short, and Yara is defeated immediately after Conan says the incantation that the alien told him about. The priest has a few lines, and he seems appropriately evil with how he enslaved and tortured the elephant-man hybrid alien, but he's barely in the story. I suppose, given the practical limitations of the Pulp Fiction genre, where most of the stories submitted had to be short stories, if we have to not focus on one element of the story in favor of having a long conversation with the alien about his past and what kind of a being he is, that's perfectly fine with me. In any case, despite that criticism, I really enjoyed The Tower of the Elephant. It's definitely my favorite of the Conan stories I've done a review slash retrospective on so far. The other two stories were also quite enjoyable, and this one is much less epic on a grand scale than the Scarlet Citadel. There's no kind of like giant battle scenes between armies in this one, but I enjoyed the science fiction elements so much that the scene between Conan and the elephant alien put it over the top for me. Since we're at the end here, I'd like to give you, dear listeners, some friendly reminders regarding the show. In the description of this video below, you'll find links to a number of things. The first one is a link to the free YouTube audiobook of The Tower of the Elephant that I had excerpts from in this video. Uh, that one was done by Pulp Hero Audio. They do a great job, and I would highly recommend, if you're interested in experiencing this story in audio form, that you check it out. Since all of Conan's original adventures are old enough to be in the public domain and therefore have less stringent copyright protection, many talented people have made Howard Conan audiobooks of their own on YouTube, which is fantastic. It's an easy way to digest some of these stories. Many of them are only about an hour or two long. So if you're interested in checking out The Tower of the Elephant while you're working out or something, check out the link in the description. I also have links to all of the Conan Chronicles social media pages in the description, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever major social media platform you prefer, I've got pages for the podcast there. On those pages, I provide regular updates regarding the show, including when episodes go live, so check them out if you don't want to miss any future episodes. 
And finally, I have a link in the description for the Conan Chronicles Patreon page where you can support the show. Any amount you can give really helps out. With all of that said, I hope those of you who have maybe just stumbled onto the show with this episode will consider subscribing to the channel if you like the podcast. There's so many exciting reviews and retrospectives coming in the future. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please consider sharing, commenting, hitting the like button on this video, as all of that helps the show reach more people. I'm trying to build a fan community around Conan here where we can kind of all discuss why we like this character so much and the great stories that have been told with the character over the years. So all of those things help us reach more people and therefore bring in more of an audience and more fans to join the discussion. All right, so... If you enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll also join us for the next installment in the Robert E. Howard Conan review slash retrospective series, which will be on 1933's The Black Colossus. For now, though, dear listener, I bid you farewell. I know Lords and Shim who would trade the secret of the Elephant Tower for her, he said, returning to his ale. A touch on his tunic sleeve made him turn his head, scowling at the interruption. He saw a tall, strongly made youth standing beside him. This person was as much out of place in that den as a gray wolf among mangy rats of the gutters. His cheap tunic could not conceal the hard, rangy lines of his powerful frame, the broad, heavy shoulders, the massive chest, lean waist, and heavy arms. His skin was brown from outland suns, his eyes blue and smoldering. A shock of tousled black hair crowned his broad forehead. From his girdle hung a sword and a worn leather scabbard. The coffee and involuntarily drew back, for the man was not one of any civilized race he knew. Hark into this heathen, he bellowed. I suppose you are some sort of a northern barbarian? I am a Sumerian. The outlander answered in no friendly tone. 